for people who are deceived. Look for people who are seeking feelings, blessings, experiences, healings, angels, whatever, that are only interested in the byproducts of the faith, not in Christ. Come out from among them. Run for your life. Because this is about your life. It's not just about an imposing theology or conflicting viewpoint on Jesus. This is about your life. Run from gospels that focus only on success and prosperity. Run. Run from churches where men and not Christ are glorified. Run. Run. Body of Christ, run. Get out. Run from churches where you're comfortable in your sins. Run from preachers that stand and tell stories and jokes. Run like you've never run before. Visst ikke Herren bygger huset. Hvis det ikke er han som leder arbeidet. Hvis det ikke er hans ord med bygge på. Hans ord med handle på. Det du handler med, du bygger med, du arbeider med forgjeves. Velkommen tilbake til Reformerte Lekmenn. Mitt navn er Håvard Handland, og med meg i studio er jeg Thomas Opstad, og min gode venn Nahum O'Brien, som er gjesten i studio i dag. Han er engelsktalerne, som jeg skal snart få han på, og bytte over til engelsk, alle mann. Men før det så, så hemmer det litt på norsk. Meg og Thomas, vi er lekmenn begge to, og det er vi også når det kommer til engelsken, så dere får ha litt nåde med dere i i uh, hvordan vi formulerer oss, så får vi håpe det går greit. Hvor står du til, Thomas? Nå var det en stund, stund siden vi, vi har vært på her. Det var en veldig lang stund siden jeg kjenner det skulle være godt. Går vi litt i gang igjen? Stemmer det. Det ble litt sånn... Uh, litt juleaffære, litt hektiske ting. Og, ja. ja, så det var... Det var vi trengte en liten pause, en liten pust i bakken, men uh, vi håper vi kommer oss opp og går igjen. Og, så, så se frem til mye spennende episoder fremgjennom, og, og, og uh, følg med på kanalen. Ja, tror jeg vi får på uh, Nahum her. Uh, good evening, or good morning, or... <laughs> good evening. Welcome. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Nahum? Yes, so my name is Nahum O'Brien, and uh, if you can't tell, I am American, and... Um, <clears throat> America. <yeah. laughs> uh, we, my wife and I are here um, as friends with uh, Shielden, the church, mm. uh, and... Um, we met a few years ago, and they uh, invited us over to come over and to work in the church with them. So uh, we're here under a work visa with the, with Shielden, and uh, I just got here in September, so we're now trying to get settled. Yeah, mm. so. yeah very good. He has been trying to accumulate to the Norwegian culture, and also, uh, and with that, adapting to football. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. You don't have football in America. Uh, no. You don't even know what it is. <laughs> <huh>? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, we call it soccer, um, yeah. which uh, Edward says is not the right word. It's like hand egg ball, hand egg foot. Yeah, yeah. yeah hand egg ball, maybe. Um, but yeah, so what, what uh, Tomas is referring to is <laughs> the other day I was in Narva <clears throat> and I was walking around and uh, saw a, uh, a bunch of soccer m- memorabilia or uh, paraphernalia. And um, it was the Vikings, the mm. Vikings football club. And I was like, it had a good logo. It had a, a good name, the Vikings. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the merchandise looked good. So <clears throat> I went and bought some. I bought a flag and I bought one of those little scarves. And uh, I... And Thomas got mad. Yeah, huh? he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got <laughs> disappointed. Because <laughs> yeah. you're a... You're a Brune fan. Brune fan, yes. Oh, yeah. hmm. That's the history of like uh, Brune, they are farmers and Viking, they are rich uh, oil people. So uh, there's always been a large rivalry and you choosing Viking. Or it makes me understand more about depravity of man. <laughs> like we are inclined to choose evil. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
Now, you know, you know <laughs> the, the thing that kept me there, though, with the Vikings was the fact that everybody hated the Vikings here in North. <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing you don't do with Americans is be like, you'd be hated if you do this. But you live at Bruni. I, I live at Bruni, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, but, you, di you didn't believe in depravity, <clears throat> but then you... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it was the logo. The Bruna, they might have a great football team, great history, but they have a terrible <laughs> logo. It looks like a tomato sitting on top of a lettuce leaf. Maybe that keeps with the farmer's thing, but it looks like it was done in the 1940s, and it needs to be updated right quick. And then maybe, maybe I'll switch. I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> Biblical forgiveness right there. <laughs> All right. The, the topic for today is going to be hermeneutics, and um, that's something that Nahum likes to... Uh, no, that's something of your um, hobby horse. Is uh, that a, is the, yeah. is that a good word? Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's an area that I I'm probably I wouldn't say most interested in, but definitely interested mm. in, above more things. Uh, I'm also doing my uh, doctor of ministry work in it as well. So, yeah. um, so it's kind of a consumes my time, and obviously the podcast that I started, mm. the Hermeneutics podcast, is. Uh, is, is going quite well from what I expected it to do. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, talk a little <clears throat> bit more about that uh, podcast. Where can you find it and w what is it about? Yeah, the Hermeneutics podcast is, is just that. It's a podcast about hermeneutics. I was very original in naming it, obviously. Um, but uh, what it is, is is a it's slowly teaching through a hermeneutics course in 15 to 20 minute bite size segments. So people can listen to it um, going to work and, and listening to it on a jog or something. Uh, but it basically will walk through a, a hermeneutics course, teaching them how to become more confident and competent in in uh, interpreting the Bible, and as well as interviews. Uh, we do some interviews that interview scholars on and uh, authors on on their books and stuff like that. So it, mm. it's it's really fun to do for me. Uh, it started as a um, the doctoral project was an idea of teaching hermeneutics in the local church, as uh, as most people aren't familiar with uh, how to study their Bible. Mm. Um, they, not to jump right into the content, but <clears throat> I've been part of churches where um, literally they'll take they'll take a book or their Bible and just let it fall open. Mm -hmm. And then you blindly pick a verse out of the book and uh, you say, okay, what does that verse mean to me? Uh, and, that, and that's a terrible, terrible idea. Mm. Uh, what if you come upon, <clears throat> you know, Psalm one, what is it, one forty-seven nine? Blessed be the one that dashes the children against the stones. What does that mean to me? <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> you know, <laughs> it doesn't. All that to say is, it doesn't matter what it means to you. It matters what it means, yeah, uh, and what it means is what it means to you. <clears throat> so, what, where can we find your podcast? Oh uh, yeah, it's on. It should be available in any platform around. Uh, it's just simply called the Hermeneutics Podcast. So it's on yeah. Apple, it's on Spotify, I think, in other yeah. places. Yeah. So check that out. I really oh. recommended it. Um, a good place to start, I think, is just to ask the question. I know we have talked a little bit about the topic here on this show before, but um, now we have uh, a guy that knows a little bit more about the topic than we do. We do. So now. Uh, Let's start with asking the question, what is hermeneutics and, and what does it mean, the word? It's yeah. a fancy word. <clears throat> it is a fancy word, uh, yeah. Um, so it really, it comes from, and I, I found this interesting myself, and just to be clear, I, I'm not an expert on, on hermeneutics, mm. but uh, I'm, I'm just a <clears throat> student of it, and I, and I enjoy studying the, the topic. Uh, but it comes from, you're familiar with a Greek god, mm. the messenger of the Greek gods was a guy named, or a, I guess a, a runner named Hermes. Uh, and he served as a messenger from the gods, transmitting and interpreting what the gods were saying to the people. Uh, oftentimes it was unfortunate news, but uh, he was the one in charge of doing that. And so Hermes was, that carries over into hermeneutics. Uh, I, I don't, there's theories as to who first used the term, uh, and, and I don't remember off the top of my head who did it, but uh, basically the, the Greek term uh, in its noun form, it, it's uh, hermeneia, and it means to interpret or to translate. In its verb form, uh, hermeneuin, it means to explain, to interpret or translate. Uh, and so <clears throat> in essence, then, uh, hermeneutics involves the, the task of interpreting, uh, translating, or explaining uh, the text. And I, I pulled some definitions for for you all in one book uh, introduction to biblical interpretation it's a fantastic book um from klein blomberg and hubbard they said and I'll, and I'll quote this in fields like biblical studies or literature 
It refers to the task of explaining the meaning of a piece of writing. Hermeneutics describes the principles that people use to understand what something means to comprehend what a message, whether written, oral, or visual, is endeavoring to communicate. So quite simply, if you want to, just a phrase, hermeneutics is the art and science of biblical interpretation. Hmm. Yeah, very good answer. Um, can, can we start to just compare different hermeneutical uh, methods that are amongst Christians today? Maybe that could be a good place to start. <clears throat> Because there are many different ways people interpret the Bible. Yeah, and, and that's been true throughout history as mm. well. Um, and so historically, what you have coming out of uh, Judaism was a, a system that the, the rabbis uh, interpreted the text of the Old Testament uh, and often they did so very allegorically. Mm. Uh, An allegory is not the recommended necessarily um, uh, way. If, as long as if you, th- there's a correct way of doing it, and uh, we had a a guy on my podcast he didn't get to air yet, but Dr. Craig Carter, he he was kind of uh, supporting it a little bit if it's done right, uh, because we even find examples of it. Sometimes Paul used it once in the New Testament, said by way of allegory, let's talk about this. Mm. Um, so. There's a correct way of doing it, but typically it's done in a disastrous way. Uh, but as you move to um, the, the Middle Ages, the, the early church had some uh, blending of what we would now look at a, a historical um, critical approach or a, a historical grammatical approach to hermeneutics. But before you go there, yeah. you, you said that <clears throat> um, rabbis used uh, a allegorical method. Yeah. I thought, always thought the rabbis and the Jews were very uh, say literal. Literal, literal in their interpretation. It, uh, but it w- was it more normal to, to by the rabbis to have a um, uh, allegorical way of interpreting the Bible? Yeah, yeah again, it's been a while since I've, I've looked, uh, I've read on this mm. particular uh, aspect of it, but... They they do they did have a literal aspect to them, but they also allegorized the text. Okay. Um, so you, you could say both and. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. But when you got to the first century, for instance, they had developed a whole new set of rules to mm-hmm. where Jesus was saying, you know, you, you teach as the law of God, the commandments of man, the traditions mm-hmm. of man. Um, and so, how did they get there? Well, they they allegorized the text in some t- in some sense. They uh, principalized the text to, to so much so that. You got past the original intent. For instance, <clears throat> the uh, the commandment not to work on the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. Um, by the time Jesus was around, born, uh, it was illegal to uh, even scoot your chair back in the dust on the Sabbath because that would create a rail of a, a groove in the dirt. Mm. Because at, at the core of it, what is from an agrar- agrarian culture, what is working on the Sabbath was well, uh, keeping the the farm, and so what, what does that mean? Well, it's disturbing the ground, mm-hmm. uh, and so in the the infancy gospel of Thomas that we were talking about, the apocryphal book, um, <clears throat> Jesus, even in the text of Scripture, uh, Jesus was getting critiqued by the Pharisees for taking mud and spitting in it and rubbing it into, into man the blind man's eyes to heal him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you you have these traditions that have become about through really through faulty methods of hermeneutics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I also read a, a rabbi that uh, talked about uh, uh, what the Jews had made, uh, th- those extra laws they have made to protect the law, yeah. that, uh, the, the Sabbath. And one of them said that they weren't allowed to look themselves in a mirror because hmm. then they would be tempted to, to pull out the gray hair if they saw one. <laughs> that was work. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I was reminded of one recently where... Uh, you weren't allowed to walk a certain distance. Yeah. And so how did the Jews get around that? Well, they started leaving household items in various spots around the city. So if I could walk a certain distance, pick up some household items there, I'm at home again, and then I can go on to the next little pocket of household <laughs> items. Mm. And that's how they would walk longer than the prescribed distance. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. But if we go further, are there... If, if we talk about different uh, ways of interpreting the Bible today amongst Christians, yeah. what are some popular way and very normal ways that are uh, normal uh, 
ways to interpret the Bible that would be different from what you would say is an uh, orthodox way? Hmm. Yeah, well, it's, it's hard to say orthodox <clears throat> because, again, there's been various um, hmm. methods used throughout the history of the church. Um, and generally, the one that um, it kind of builds around is the historical <clears throat> historical grammatical approach, hmm. uh, which is simply um, taking interpreting the text through its what the text actually says, the grammatical aspect of it, and the historical aspect of what is it saying in context of what it, of, of the time and the author that hmm. it's being said in. Other approaches that are around today, you, again, you have the allegorical that's still around. Uh, you have um, more of a historical critical, where um, typically you get rid of anything miraculous. Uh, you, you doubt and disbelieve certain portions of the of the Bible. Mm. Uh, and so a historical critical approach alone it can be quite dangerous, and it's typically used by um, maybe less than orthodox believers. When you get to, you can also have more of a reader response. So typically it falls on a line of a scale. Uh, you have so far as how do you determine meaning. So you have the author determines meaning, you have the text determines meaning, and you have the reader that determines meaning. These are the three options you huh. really have. And so there are various methods fall along that scale. Hmm. And so the the danger with the, the, the – everybody wants to say that the, the author determines meaning. The problem with that is the author is no longer around. How do we know what the author wrote? The, the author wrote, and that's the only way we know what the author wrote is from what he left behind the text. Mm. And so in some ways it's a mixture between authorial intent and, and textual intent. Uh, but some people would argue that the author's intent doesn't matter, that you just – read the text, and the text determines uh, what it can mean. But you don't have to worry about what the author meant by what he said, just what it means now in, in mm. as bare words. And then you also have the reader response in which uh, the reader can determine the meaning, even if it's apart from um, <clears throat> uh, the, what the author intended, or even what the text clearly says in front of you. Uh, I can interpret it to mean whatever I want it to mean. Um, especially, and that's a really popular amongst the postmodern and, and the post-postmodern crowds, is when there's no objective truth and everything's subjective and relative, uh, I can make it say or I can have it mean whatever I want it to mean to me. So mm. that, that generally there's a lot of different methods, and it's really hard to, to pick because a lot of pe- most people use a com- combination of multiple different methods, uh, and but generally they fall on that scale. Mm. Yeah. Um. Are you supposed to, because the Bible have different genres, Yeah. are you supposed to change the hermeneutic when the topic or genre changes, or are you supposed <clears throat> to have a consistent hermeneutic through all of the Bible? Uh, both and. Okay. Uh, there, there's, there's some things um, that you would say, are, we divide hermeneutics up, the art of science of hermeneutics, into what's called general hermeneutics. Uh, principles of interpretation that we use um, with the whole of Scripture. And then there you can narrow it down to special hermeneutics. And so special hermeneutics is different rules that I would use, for instance, uh, with prophetic books than with um, the wisdom books. Um, so there was slightly different uh, methods and, and rules that I would use in interpreting the the, apocry- you know, the apocryphal books or the, mm. the Book of Revelation, Book of Daniel, Ezekiel, stuff like that, than I would do interpreting uh, historical narratives. So, there, But there's some that you would use all throughout. Mm. For instance, um, we can talk about uh, generally we the Bible is to be taken literally um, <clears throat> until you get into metaphors or figures of speech. Obviously, the Bible is not meant to be taking, quote-unquote, literally there, even though you're taking it literalistically. So when Jesus says, I am the door, you don't say Jesus is a solid piece of wood with hinges and a doorknob. You know, he's not claiming to be that. Mm. Uh, but in a very real way, through the use of metaphor, Jesus is describing a reality. So he's being literal through figurative language. So, the, yeah, there, I would say both and. Mm. Yeah. Because uh, a very normal uh, debate uh, amongst Christians today is that one side claims that yeah we just read what it's um, no we we just uh, read what it says you know uh, we just interpret it literally and it shouldn't be a problem and you just spiritualize the text right what would you say to that dichotomy there say that again uh, what would you say to someone that criticizes you for just spiritualizing the text you should be taking it literal 
Yeah, well, I, I would say I, I need to be interpreting the text the way the text is intended to be interpreted. Hmm. Um, going back to the Jesus is the door example. Yeah. Um, G, again, if I, if I take it, if I'm just absolutely um, hard-headed and I want to take it literally, then I, I've developed a now a cult yeah. because now mm-hmm. I'm saying that Jesus is a piece of oak mm. and uh, he has hinges and, you know, you can go on into allegorizing that mm. if you want. But... It, the idea is Jesus is using a metaphor. So when it comes to certain texts or something like that, you, you're supposed to interpret it the way it's intended to be interpreted. Uh, when it comes to, can, can you think of a specific text that you're you, you're wondering about? Uh, no, uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, a good well, question. I, I know that <clears throat> Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. Uh, their view on God is like is that he he has he is has a human body. Yeah. And that's because they have interpreted the uh, text that describes God in a literal way. When God says, my right hand or my eyes are upon the earth, yeah. and and, uh, and that that has made them interpret God as being a human with, with uh, uh, not a human, but a, yeah. a being with a body. Yeah. When the scripture says that he is a spirit. Yeah. And uh, that would maybe, maybe be one example of how it... To to just interpret the whole Bible literally, it would end up in yeah in yeah. heresy. That's a, that's a, that's <laughs> a perfect example. And, and mm. so what they're doing is they're taking um, I forget the technical term for it, but uh, the author is using ideas An- anthropomorphism. There, yeah, mm. it, it goes the ideas about God that we would understand. Um, when we know that God is spirit, mm-hmm. um, but yet He says, "I'm going to hold you in My hand." It's 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 a it's a word picture yeah. that the author is using to to show us a truth that that we are um, we are safe. And in the same way, like the the psalmist says, "God is my rock." Uh, we're not He's not a rock. Hmm. Okay? God is not a rock that we can just go out and climb on. But it's I, it's identifying a, a sense of protection and, and steadiness and, hmm. and that we have in God. Mm. As our as our rock, he is our as our hard um, as our foundation that's not going to be moved. Mm. So yeah, so this that's the idea. We can use figurative language, figures of speech, but to develop theologies off of that it would would be um, quite alarming. It would be very careful. You you, you <clears throat> mentioned uh, earlier about just opening the Bible and putting your finger down on the page and just asking what does this mean for me and and so forth and and. You also have, uh, yeah, you have that abstract interpretation of the Bible. It's like abstract art. You look at a picture and you say, "What does? What do I think that picture is?" You know. Yeah. And many people um, um, think like that when it come when they come to the Bible. They they uh, use it as abstract art. And uh, can you give us some examples? And also. Um, the seriousness and, and uh, why it's why is it wrong to to handle the Bible in that way? Yeah, so let's go, let's go through some um, some silly examples we can all enjoy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we had mentioned some before we started the podcast that were quite funny, but I, I remember what, what got me interested in this was uh, the church background that I had. Um, the way the church went, you could have a really good teacher come, and then you could have really bad teachers come into the same church. Um, <clears throat> so you didn't really know what you were going to get from a week-to-week uh, basis. And I remember hearing stuff that was just so confusing, because obviously that's not what the text is saying. Uh, for instance, when uh, we were talking about this earlier, when Jesus was walking on the shore post-resurrection, the disciples are out fishing, Peter sees Jesus, and he says, well, I need to get to Jesus. So he, he grabs his cloak, he puts it on, and he jumps into the sea, and he swims to Jesus. Now, the preacher that I was listening to that day told me that that is the reason why we dress our best before we come to church. Mm. Because you know, if you're going to go meet Jesus, you need to be well-dressed. Now, did that have anything to do whatsoever with what the author was talking about? Absolutely not. Mm. Uh, he's taking a historical narrative, a little a little detail <clears throat> in a historical narrative, and, and uh, the difference between pulling meaning out of the text, exegesis, and pulling putting meaning into the text, eisegesis. Mm. Um, he went from exegesis over to eisegesis to make a point that he already wanted to make. Yeah. Um, another silly example, um, <clears throat> I mean, we could say uh, Daniel in a lion's den. It's not a, a story about how we should treat animals. Uh, mm. You know, it's not that. Uh, it's it's not. Uh, 
Um, the, the fiery furnace is not a prescription for, you know, for how to make a fire. Uh, mm. You could say David and the five smooth stones. I heard this one from a preacher, actually. Uh, David and the five smooth stones. Um, so he combines two texts that are completely unrelated. Uh, the genres are different in the sense of the Old Testament, New Testament. Um, but uh, David picked out the five smooth stones to go kill Goliath. And um, by the way, uh, you're not David in, in the story mm. of David and Goliath. You're mm-hmm. not supposed to go pick out your Goliaths in life and see how you can destroy them. That's not the point of that text. Um, but so we go into the five smooth stones, and he connects it with the one where Jesus is triumphal entry, and the people are praising mm. him as the Messiah, the coming Messiah, and the Pharisees are upset. And so they say, why are the people praising you? You should stop them. And Jesus says, well, you know, if these people stop praising me as a Messiah, the stones would cry out. Mm. And so if the stones can cry out, now I'm going to take that principle, and I'm going to take it back to David's stones, the five smooth stones, and allegorize that text and say, what would David Stones be crying out to us today? And so one of the things is that you tithe your in tithe well uh, above the 10% that this preacher was asking. You should wear a suit and tie, preferably a double-breasted suit. Uh, the third one, and there's just, it's just on and on and on. And it's just what in the world just happened to the text? Mm. Uh, he just ignored the text. Now, why is that bad? Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's an important mm, point. And, and really, we could go into <clears throat> why why we need hermeneutics, uh, kind of in that same idea. Um, but let's, let's start with why it's bad first. Um, so there's reasons why mistreating Scripture is bad. And, and the first that I would say is your hermeneutics drives your, your theological enterprise. I'm not, get, I'm not coining this. This is something that I pulled from a, a collection of different authors and speakers and stuff like that. So it drives your theological enterprise. And what that means is, to quote Verkler, hermeneutics is not isolated from other fields of biblical study. It is related to the study of canon, textual criticism, historical criticism, exegesis, and a biblical and systematic theology. So basically what we're saying is hermeneutics, how you interpret, your principles you use to interpret the Bible, is the foundation of your exegesis. Your exegesis is the foundation of your biblical and systematic theologies. And so the theology that you have will ultimately be derived from how you treat the Bible. But apart from all that, uh, another reason why uh, this is bad and wrong is because it is possible to study the Bible wrong. Hmm. You know, so uh, God tells us, or Paul tells us, that um, to be good stewards of the Word, um, how does he say it? Uh, To divide the Word. Rightly dividing the Word of truth. If you can Hmm. rightly divide it, there's a way to wrongly divide yeah. it. And so it's, it's, and I agree with the author, he says it's, it's a moral issue mm. that God cares how we interpret the scriptures. Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 20, I'll put this in my notes. Uh, <clears throat> Moses writes, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from their brothers, or among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded him, and whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require of him. But the prophet who possesses, or sorry, to presses to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Hmm. God holds the prophets accountable for what they are saying God is saying. Yeah. And so in the same way, God's word, God's uh, inspired word, his what he has said in his word, if we say that God says something which he did not say, we have created a moral offense against God. Now, we have lied, and God holds us accountable for that. Now, it gets even deeper when you could say, well, we're not intending to get it wrong. It's just an accident. Because let's let's be fair, we have the human element in, in, in regards to interpretation, where typically we are uh, let's start from the beginning. A doc- what's crazy is hermeneutics is tied to all the other doctrines. So now you tie it to the doctrine of depravity. And so man is, by nature, we have darkened understandings. We have uh, bents towards sin. Uh, we have, from, from a, even apart from the sinful aspect, we have different capacities, different intellectual capacities. We have different tastes. We have different qualities about us. Uh, we have different levels of education. Um, that's why someone who has never heard about hermeneutics may be less 
uh, gifted at interpreting the Bible than maybe I am, and I might be less gifted than someone who's been learning and teaching hermeneutics for the past 20, 30 years. You, you, you become more proficient in it. And in general, you have our nationalities, uh, our, our languages, our forms of thought, our customs and immorals. These are all things that we come to the text with that inadvertently may affect the way that we interpret the text. Uh, and so all that to say is God cares how his word is interpreted. And uh, misunderstanding is always possible. And that's why it's dangerous, and that's why it's wrong to, to interpret it wrongly. Hmm. Yeah, yeah you, you, you talked about um, sin, and sin can... Um, uh, uh, sin can affect us in a way that clutters our reading of the Bible. Hmm. And uh, can, can you also, of course... Uh, sin is at the root of of uh, all of this. But uh, if if you if we are going to go a little bit further, wouldn't it be true that we also have traditions? And and could could you mention maybe other things that makes us go wrong when we read a text? Yeah. Well, we we, we talk. There's two things that could go wrong. There's there's um, well, there's multiple things that can go mm. wrong. But two, maybe two. Um, levels maybe uh one is what you bring to the text yeah and one is another is what your information that you're lacking from understanding the text so it could be it could be both um so <clears throat> what did you have in mind particularly uh, this, this was a very good example what you said i i always remember uh, a guy told me that you should read the bible just like you go to a restaurant it's not allowed to bring food <laughs> You have to eat what you get there. And uh, what's interesting, it's a simple uh, picture, but uh, I, I understood what he meant. But it's difficult to know if you have brought something to the Scripture because that's a part of your tradition. And it's, and it's uh, uh, you, the way you read the Bible um, okay. uh, has been affected of your upbringing, yeah. the peoples around you. And and uh, to examine your traditions, how would that be possible with all that baggage? How how do we know? How, how can we figure out where we have traditions? Well, so you you <coughs> have you have that which you know of, and you have that which you don't know of, mm. and uh, that which you know of, you can hopefully um, place aside and try to, and that's why we we we'd say that you know you go and you pull meaning out of the text. Mm. Uh, but even what you bring in inherently and intuitively that you don't know about is going to affect the way you read it. Mm. Um, I <clears throat> I remember a story of, uh, I believe it was a missionary, he was talking about uh, teaching this the uh, the prodigal son, the, the, the parable of the prodigal son to two different cultures. One was like, I think it was like an Eastern culture that had a much more honor, shame society and had a much more community aspect. And one was a Western culture. And I think the, the, I'm recalling this off the top of my head, but I believe that the question was asked after they read through the text of the parable of the prodigal son, um, what was the reason or the cause for the prodigal son's uh, decision to go to back to his father? What was, what was the reason why he got to that point? And the Westerners, <clears throat> they th took the idea and they were thinking, well, it's because the uh, prodigal son took all this money and he lived frivolously and he spent it needlessly. He wasted, uh, he wasted this financial blessing that he had that he essentially stole from his father. And um, he... That after losing that through his frivolous living, that's the point of no return. He had to go back to the father. Now the Eastern concept, while they while they recognize that, they grasped more on the idea that there was a famine in the land, mm. that there was a famine in the land, which Westerners typically don't even realize is in the text. There was a famine in the land that caused such an economic downturn that this man went broke, and furthermore, the community didn't help him when he was in need. And so they latched on to the idea that there was this massive famine, that the rest of the community wasn't helping him when he was in need, therefore he had to go. Mm. And so so what's the true reason why he had to go back to the Father? And you could see how a Westerner would look at it differently than maybe an Easterner, just from 
Uh, and that might be very general as far as like people groups and stuff. But uh, there was two different people groups that were reading the same text and coming to different conclusions about why he had to go back to the father. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that can show you how our and our inherent um, miscon or, or our inherent uh, biases, I guess you would say, uh, influence the text even when we don't realize it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Good example. Uh, a little. I think it's a related question. Why is it that many pastors and theologians that say that they have the same hermeneutic, and it's usually the historical grammatical her- hermeneutic, they say they use that hermeneutic when they come to the Bible, but still they end up with different interpretations of the Bible. Why is that? Uh, honestly, it's the same reason why we could both watch the same game, or we could see the same car accident, and if you ask us to file a report on what happened in the crime or in, in the car accident, uh, we would have different reports. Hmm. Uh, it's because of our perspectives and what we pull out of the text. Uh, it could be what we what inf- what emphasis that we see in the text when it's uh, maybe different for both of us. Um, and again, there is a right way to interpret the text, but and, and good, well-meaning people can interpret it wrongly. And so, ultimately, what you have with <clears throat> communication. As we were talking about this before, you have the there's, there's five really um, parts of a communicative process. You have the sender, which is now me speaking to you. Uh, you have the message that I am speaking, which is uh, the message itself is a third point, but my speaking it. The way am I writing it? Am I speaking it? Am I am I uh, doing some kind of charades? Mm. Um, or how am I encoding the process to you? Uh, and then there's you, the receiver, the fifth point, who is decoding. How are you receiving this? And we said normally you have a, a feedback going on. You have you guys telling me that you misunderstood. We, we don't have that with, with written communications oftentimes. Uh, imagine finding a, a letter, a poem uh, in the woods. You don't know who the author is. You don't know who the recipient is. You just find the poem. Uh, are you free then to just interpret that however you want? Let's say it's a love poem. And... Uh, clearly, an, uh, a male individual is is uh, is um, and expressing his undying love towards his uh, female companion. Okay, are you now free uh, to to take that upon yourself, switch the genders, and be like, oh man, this is a letter of love. My my long lost admirer is now loving me. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, you're, you're not free to do that because that wasn't written to you. Uh, it what didn't have you in mind. What he's communicating wasn't communicating to you. So there's there's a whole issues with that. Uh, and on top of that, there's there's different things uh, <clears throat> that we call noise in in the communicative process. And so we uh, I was I worked in the military for a while, and I was in satellite communications, and we would send uh, signals across through the satellites um, down through another base on, on the other side of the world. And generally the same process is, was had. You had a message, you sent it, so you have the sender, you have the way you sent it, uh, you have the decoding of the message, and t- sometimes you would uh, encrypt it, so you have now an encryption device, and you send it the message, and it comes down to the receiver who has the decryption device, and he can read what you, what you sent. Now, if someone didn't have the decryption and device, they would have no earthly idea what I sent. And so on all that, you have what's called noise. And noise is anything that allow that interrupts the communicative process. So let's say we um, <clears throat> have well, different types of noise, but let's say I drop down in, into Norway. I have no idea how to speak Norwegian. That's some significant noise mm. uh, that's now in the process. Let's talk about uh, metaphors. You know, um, I, for instance, we would say uh, if I had a raspy throat voice, I would say I have a frog in my throat. I can't, can't I have something in my throat. I can't mm. speak clearly. Uh, well, different culture might say I have a cat in my throat. Now, it also comes down to uh, in, in very interesting in the actual translation process. Uh, if, if you're if you're a more dynamic translation, uh, or are you a more um, uh, a functional <clears throat> or a an, an exact word for word, do you translate it? Let's say you're doing it from the culture that says a frog in my throat to a culture that says a cat in my throat. Do you keep the frog uh, and translate it as frog in which the next culture that you're writing it into would have no earthly idea what you're talking about? Mm. Or would you change the word and you change it into a cat in my throat? So technically you're changing the word of scripture, but you're getting the idea across. And so that's an interpretive process. But um, ultimately you have all these gaps in our understanding. And what we call these gaps, we call this noise. Uh, and so you have historical challenges, literary challenges, and theolo- theological challenges. 
it, under the historical, you know, the text of scripture was written thousands of years ago. So there's this, there's this historical context that's far removed from our historical context today. You have a geographical gap. These events that are happening in scripture were far removed. Uh, the places that are happening are far removed from where we're familiar. We may not be familiar with them at all. Uh, even if you did go to Israel recently, the, the, geogra- the geography might have changed significantly since you've been there. Um, there are also the cultural gap. These are cultures being reflected in the Bible that are drastically different than our own. And so we could go through the language gap. I mean, obviously, that's written in, in Hebrew and, and, and Greek. There's the literary gap. There's, as you mentioned, genres and subgenres that are, are confusing to us, possibly. Because, mm. again, even the uh, if you're going to say, well, that's a historical biography, even biographies from an ancient perspective are different than what we would see in mm. biographies today. Uh, you have the literary gap, the, again, the subgenres and the genres, uh, and then you have the theological, you have supernatural realities that you either got to accept or, or, or deny, uh, and that, again, that's what you bring to the text. Uh, critical scholars will come and say, we've already, uh, we already believe that um, miracles aren't true, they can't happen, so therefore, when we see supernatural realities in Scripture, we just deny them or explain them away. Uh, you have theological gap, which is, it's, it's God's Word is his self-revelation uh, and must be read with the expectation of what he communicates. And there's also the, the uh, when you get through all that, you still have the, the gap of applying it. Hmm. How do we now apply the text? Um, if, it says, if it says a command, is that command for me? Is that command culturally bound or is it, is it still relevant to me today? Uh, is the exact wording of the command, really, to greet one another with a holy kiss. Is that binding on Christians today? Or we, can we alternate the form of greeting? Because mm. uh, I, I did not give you brothers a holy kiss, and, <laughs> and I would be offended if you tried to give me one. Uh, and so this is... <laughs> and yeah. another cultural, cultural thing would be maybe what Peter talks about with the braidings of the hair and stuff. That is maybe not the thing that... Uh, th- that looks like a cultural thing that maybe mm. was popular at that time and to really look beautiful you would have to braid your hair and that was something that took a lot of time and I don't think that that passage forbids a girl to braid her hair and I don't think that, that passage teaches that you shouldn't wear any jewelry but uh, in that context and in that culture that was maybe how to go too far uh, showed itself in those areas maybe i yeah. don't know yeah yeah well, you have the old testament stuff too like um don't, don't uh, was it don't cut the corners off your yeah. beard um don't wear two types of clothing uh, mm. two types of material in the same outfit uh, mm. build a build a railing around your roof so people yeah. don't fall off um, yeah. So all these things are commandments in Scripture, and so what do you do with them? Mm. Um, most most of the time, you, people will say, oh, that was culturally bound or covenantly bound mm. or um, nationally bound to Israel. Uh, but then you get some stuff that we have honest disagreements with, uh, for instance, uh, head covering on women when they go mm. into, uh, th- into the church service. Um, the people who don't advocate for women's head covering somehow tie it to the historical aspect of it, this connection with... Um, what the church in Corinth was actually going through mm. during that time. Whereas other people that believe that it should be mandated for the church today, they connect it to actually creation. And they say, well, it's it's beyond the historical uh, cultural connection because this Paul ties it in with with the, uh, with creation. And so mm. it, it's, a, it's a form of um, <clears throat> respect and submission that you see through creation. Mm. And so then, but then you ask, well, okay, so if even if it's tied to creation, then how do you appropriate it for today? Or appropriating meaning applying. Yeah. So how do you apply it for today? Does it have to be applied in the same way today as it did back then? Or can it be applied differently? Uh, so you're mm-hmm. still getting the same creation uh, principle from it of submission, but then um, can, does it have to be uh, the covering? Does it have to be the same type of covering? Does it have, you, mm. see, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, so there's a, it comes out in a lot of ways, these, these gaps in our understanding. Hmm. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking because uh, <clears throat> we also uh, have this thing of uh, apostolic interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess this would also fit into this conversation. And uh, that is the idea you may have a wor- verse in uh, the Old Testament, maybe a prophecy or something, uh, talking about something happening in a specific context. And we see in the New Testament, uh, either Paul or the writer of the letter, he applies it in another context. Mm. So how are we to think about that verse that is being uh, 
said again uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament? Is it like they have uh, that one verse has two meanings or um, yeah, how, how are we to uh, what is the result uh, of this uh, apostolic uh, interpretation when uh, does that verse in uh, the Old Testament, is it to be understood in light of the verse explained in the New Testament? Hmm. Or I, I could give an example of what you're talking about. Mm. Maybe in Matthew, when it talks about, out from Egypt, I called my son. Yeah. In, Hosea. In the, yeah, yeah. And, the, and Hosea the, is quoting someone earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he's talking about uh, Israel being called out of Egypt in slavery uh, under Pharaoh. But uh, Matthew, he applies it to Jesus when he as a child was called out of Egypt. Yeah. So it's like a dual fulfillment kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah, um, the, the author we recently had on, because this is what, what's, what's crazy and being so tied to one her, hermeneutic as a, as, a, as a rule. Like I, I cannot bend. And then I, there was a funny quote that I, I included. Uh, this is why they call it um, the art and science of hermeneutics, because it is a science because it has rules, and these rules can be classified into an orderly system. Hmm. Uh, but it's called an art because communication is flexible, and therefore a mechanical and rigid application of rules will sometimes distort the true meaning of the text. So you don't want to be too rigid to your hermeneutic that you can't, uh, that, that you would say, because if you're strictly a, a, a historical critical hermeneutic, you cannot abide by what some of the authors of the New Testament did, uh, to, to our point. Hmm. Uh, because he, how would you ever, from reading Hosea, come to the conclusion that Matthew did? Yeah. I mean, mm. from, from a strictly historical critical approach. Mm. Uh, you don't, because Hosea is talking about um, a, a different point than he wasn't talking about Jesus. Yeah, um, but Matthew sees the text and, and appropriates it to you. So all this to say is, it's kind of where I'm at right now, where um, we, how we interpret the Bible, has to be tied with how we see the Bible interpreting itself, hmm. how we see the authors of Scripture interpreting itself. And I think we do a disservice when we just say, well, it has to be this method, and we stick we, we stick so close to that rules. Um, for instance, one of the general principles of hermeneutics is that you need to interpret the Bible just like you would do every other book. The problem with that is, like, generally I would say that's a good rule. The problem is the Bible is not like any other book, okay? This is a self-revelation of God. You have a dual authorship. Mm. You have, it's an, under inspiration. You have an ultimate author, which is God, who is the author of the entire thing. And then you have the human author, uh, which is the author of individual sections of the scriptures. Mm. Uh, and so could you have, in what Craig Carter called, layers of meaning, where the the meaning that the New Testament pulls out of the text is not necessarily um, against or opposed or contradictory to what the original Old Testament author mean, but is an extension of it. It's, a, it's another layer of meaning that maybe the human author didn't intend, but the divine author did. Mm. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting aspect of hermeneutics that, I'm, that, I'm, that I'm, really, I'm really into right now. Well... It's a fun subject, and it's an important subject, <clears throat> and uh, this will be part one, and we will have uh, Nahum with us uh, in one more episode that we will play after this. Uh, so for now, I will say thank you so much for joining us, Nahum, and uh, I look really forward to, to have another episode, and we will dive into some uh, more um, heavy subjects around this uh, topic. So um, I'll switch to Norwegian. Oh, well, so... Då, då pustar jag djupt ut. Det, engelsk är inte mitt uh, moderspråk, så, så, men, men det gick ju grejt. Du klarade det väldigt gott. Ja. Okej, okay, vi kör på med en till episode, men den släpper mig inte för om någon uh, vecka, så följ gärna med. Det är mycket spännande frågor vi ska snacka om då också, som omhandlar detta tema om kurs med tolk i Bibeln och med, med överskrift och den här fan, fancy ordet hermeneutik. Så Följ gärna med och del och lik episoden också. Ja, med det så tror jag säger på igen hör.